One of the hardest things about having a website where I recommend parts for FPV drones is keeping that website up to date. The FPV world moves fast and the latest state-of-the-art stuff that's best for people to buy today may not be the same as it is in a couple weeks or months. And frankly, how do you know what the best stuff is? Well, it turns out that in the world of FPV racing, there's a definitive way of knowing if not the best stuff, well then certainly what the best pilots are using. Because my guest today, Sean Ames of the MultiGP, Sean, you do a survey every year of the pilots at the MultiGP Nationals about what kind of gear that they're using. Yeah, uh, you know, really we started doing it, I started doing it a few years ago uh, as a way to, you know, identify what was out there. I think I had kind of some selfish reasons of doing it. I wanted to know, you know, what the fastest pilots were using. It was surprising how many people were excited about it whenever I, you know, posted that survey and then especially posted the results. So recently I sat down to update my website. I have a page on my website, uh, the ultimate FPV shopping list. It's on fpvknowitall.com. That's with a URL. Uh, and one of the pages there is the best five inch racing FPV drones in parts. And when I sat down to renew it, I thought, well, I should just steal your work. I should just look at everything that the pros are using. And obviously that's what I should be recommending. But what I want to do with you, to, and, and there's a few things on there that I put on there, even though pros aren't using them for reasons which we can talk about. But I, I wanted to sit down with you and kind of go through the page. Number one, so people could just see what people are using. And number two, maybe so we could get a little bit of insight into uh, into why these parts, you know, they're using these parts. Certainly. Yeah, let's check yeah. it out. Uh, before we get into that, I also want to say a big thank you. You mentioned Limon, uh, Ivan Efimov, who is uh, very involved also in, uh, I don't know to what degree he worked with you on the survey. I know you sat down with him and you did a live stream where you guys really dug deep into the results. I'll put a link to his channel and to that video that you guys did for people who really want to dive into the survey. Um, it was with his input as well. Uh, I took your survey results. I talked to him about how to write this stuff up. And he should get a lot of credit, but uh, you're the one we're sitting down with to interview because you're the guy who actually did the survey. And I thought that was that was uh, appropriate. So we're going to start with bind and fly, ready to fly drones. I always try and recommend ready to fly and bind and fly drones because let's face it, not everybody wants to build from scratch, especially in the world of racing. Let me just ask you, is anybody who's racing flying bind and flies or are they all like, like at the higher levels? <laughs> there are, I know of a few people that, buy bind and flies from pilots i definitely uh, that's exactly a thing and so um that's something i've been aware of over the past couple of years and there's definitely a good chance now that there are uh racing stores right. providing bind and flies exactly it's hard to know but i would i would venture to guess that those people that were buying kind of one-off bind and flies from people um are just now going and ordering them there but uh but there have been some pro level pilots that i'm aware of that would buy uh, would have people build their gear. I'm not sure if that changed exactly. throughout the years, but I mean, it does exist, not like at a you know huge magnitude, and that's not something we've asked in our survey. Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, I think it does exist. It's probably not something that people want to brag about either. If you're interested in getting a bind and fly for racing, uh, even even if you can build, I think there's an argument to be made that maybe it would be nice to know what the exact drone that Evan Turner flies flies like. Like how much better is it than what you build? or whatever. Um, uh, most of the Biden flies that we've got recommended on this page are from 533. There's the light switch RTF. Uh, and then there's the light switch DJI, um, which is the same thing, but with a DJI 03 in it. Uh, the light switch, is that the, the sort of latest frame that 533 has put out? Yeah. The light switch V2 is, uh, is their latest, like, uh, in my understanding, and I'm not here to speak on their behalf, but sure. uh, my understanding is that's like their more general audience frame. And then the light switch ultra is like the person that just wants the absolute and highest performance and is fine if, if they're, you know, shredding arms or whatever, that's right. just, how can we get as, as, uh, right. the highest performance and like, you know, they have durability standards obviously, but, um, but I think for the most part, uh, the light switch V2 is their. Uh, flagship there. I think yeah. I, at multi-GP champs, you'd have to look at the survey, but I, I think it's the majority of the pro pilots at champs that were flying a light switch were probably flying the ultra if I had to guess, but yeah. So the ultra saves you a little bit of weight at the cost of a little bit of durability. Our, I would say uh, that, and tell me if you disagree, but I would say that a typical person who is not like at the very, very top of 
like their the performance probably is going to be better served by the standard light switch because that extra few grams of weight is not really going to be what's like if I go fly the 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 weight I save on the ultra is not really going to make me any faster it's my skill that's going to make me slow right um, yeah and that weight expo as I call it might even be good for you so, right exactly you know. <laughs> So you can buy those bind and flies from 533. We've got those linked up. Um, what's the what's the deal? What's the deal? There's a Seinfeld reference. What's the deal with the 03? Who wants a freaking racing drone with an 03 in it? Uh, good question. You know, um, I think uh, there could be pilots out there that are, well, Evan has talked about it recently, where um, there's a lot of freestyle pilots out there that fly DJI. That's exclusively exclusively sure. what they fly. Maybe they want to try to start running some gates, and here they have an opportunity to buy a legitimate race drone um, that's already, you know, coming set up for DJI. So, that's fair. Uh, I mean, why not? Um, I think... Well, uh, are, are yeah. races typically going to let a, a pilot with an O3, like, let's say you show up at a local race with this squad, are... Is it going to create issues with the timing system, with the race director? Are they going to let you race? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, uh, maybe I'll put my multi-GP hat on for a minute. Sure. Um, you know, sure. At multi-GP, um, we're still trying to figure out a way to maybe incorporate DJI into our marquee level events where we're trying to do eight up pilots. And mm -hmm. let's say IO, for instance, where there's, you know, six different tracks with eight pilots running we don't have a way that we can incorporate dji currently into those events so sure. we are really pushing hard to encourage we didn't we don't mandate but we absolutely encourage chat on you know chapters on the chapter level um to find a way to incorporate dji into their into the racing actually uh we're doing a round table uh, it will probably already have been released it's a live stream we're doing with actually mondo and evan because mm -hmm. they're on the forefront of that push of including mm -hmm. dji into the race yeah. scene i'm there in knoxville i know you've been to some of those events yeah and uh uh that you know their concept is have a separate have a, a, a dedicated class for dji yeah that that's works what great done. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's a way to do it. Our thing is there's so many people out there flying DJI that already know how to fly drones, already know how to build drones, crash drones, repair drones. Like they're in this space. And I mean, I came, I started as a freestyler. I was never good at it. Um, I've pretty quickly, uh, moved into racing, but, um, but I think that there's a big opportunity there, but it's, there's a, there's a, a brick wall between freestyle, the majority of freestyle and racing. And that is that freestyle is on DJI and racing mm -hmm. is on HD zero and analog. And, um, so and we're, we want to try to bridge that gap, but it's, exactly. uh, you know, it's something that, that, uh, is important to us, but it's just, it is a, pr a pretty big challenge. Certainly. There, there's one on here and I want to acknowledge for the people who are watching that the iFlight Mach R5 was, um, I actually, Limon explicitly said, "Ugh, get rid of it. Nobody flies that. And, and he was a stickler for not recommending products that he couldn't personally vouch for or that he didn't know racers who could vouch for. And I want to say the only reason it's on this list is 533 is based in the U.S. They do have a European warehouse, but I don't know if they sell the bind and flies because Armando personally builds those bind and flies as far as I know. And so for people around the world who maybe don't have the op a good option for a, a bind and fly racing drone, I think the iFlight Mach R5 is my pick largely because of the iFlight badge. iFlight tends to make if not necessarily the best, sometimes maybe uh, like there's the motors are kind of a weird size on here. Like why? But they make good uh, and sometimes excellent drones. And I felt like it was a safe bet for people around the world to pick. But I do want to acknowledge that no one at MultiGP Nationals is flying the Mach R5. So then we come to frames and now we're for people who are building their own. And of course, we've got the Light Switch V2 and the Light Switch Ultra, which we talked about uh, in the Bind and Fly section. We've also got the MCK Hyper. Uh, oh, sorry, the MCK and Hyper are the pilots. This is the Kronos frame. What makes that stand out to you? Yeah, it's it's definitely a frame that uh, that was built for you know that ultra light performance. I think it's right around fifty grams. And uh, uh, Hyper and Minchan, obviously, two of the best pilots in the game. You know, the motor mounts and the arms is kind of interesting. I've always found that to be uh, a little different. But um, yeah, only but two yeah. screw holes, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm. Um, <laughs> really saving weight. But then you can also see like with how the light switch ultra compares to the light switch v2 um you can tell even by the pictures that it's just a little stronger yeah i think the yeah. uh which it might say here in the write-up but uh it might be like five mil arms versus yeah five mil arms versus six mil arms on the regular light switch v2 but mm -hmm. yeah great frames 
You know, the uh, Kronos frame uh, is, he's talking about pushing the limits. Yeah. They push the limits in, in terms of the electronics mounting as well. They've, they've tightened the frames up so much that you can only mount the electronics cocked 45 degrees, right? And so some ESCs will have trouble fitting. Uh, and even if the ESC does fit, the Kronos is going to be an extremely tight build. You really need to be an experienced builder. You need to plan out your build. And if you just buy parts willy-nilly off the internet and try and cram them in here, it may not work that well. So the Kronos, I think, not for beginners. Would you yeah. would you agree? Yeah, I mean, no more than the Ultra is the uh, and and I don't know. I mean, just to be a, you know objective and fair, it seems like they have a version that is uh, standard mounting, but it only works with certain ESCs. Maybe right is that, and it might say that in here, but um, but uh, well, let's but take a look. Let's yeah. take a look. We've got the Kronos Racing Frame. Oh yeah, no, you're right. You're right. So you can get the MCK edition, which requires a rotated stack, a forty five degree stack mounting, or yeah. a straight stack version which is a little bit stretched out, but still there are some ESCs that will not fit between the standoffs. Yeah. So if you go, if you decide to build on the Kronos, recommendation would be to find someone else's build and copy it, at least as far as the uh, flight controller and ESC. Uh, Absolutely. Go. You might've been getting ready to go into this, but the Switchback Pro, uh, it's neat that it's on here. And I know this m might not help your affiliate link status, Yeah. <laughs> but the neat thing about that frame is a lot of times you can find it in the wild um, from pilots that are upgrading. Um, yeah. well, there's a, and there's a lot of things out, a lot of products out there where um, pilots want the latest and greatest, or maybe it's a sponsored pilot who gets the sure. the newest stuff. And, right. and I've, I've personally found myself with like a, a closet full of carbon and uh, I'll take it to a race sometime and just be like, who's flying this frame. And I just want to give it to them because if I, if I set it in my, if it stays in my closet for another year, then no one even wants it. You know, yeah. so it's like I, yeah. I try to I try to dish that out. So that's the nice thing about some of these other um, legacy frames. Let's say like the switchback that it was a standard yeah. for so long. It was that well, a lot so of times, long, like yeah. two years. Right. <laughs> right. It was a standard. Oh, yeah. way back when in 2020. <laughs> ah, the good old days. Yep. <laughs> but uh, you're right, though, that the switchback is basically the last generation of the light switch. And most people starting from scratch today would go with the light switch just because it's the newest. But I thought the Switchback Pro was so popular for so long that it deserved to stay on the list. It's still available from 533. Yeah. It's a little bit cheaper and it's still a really fantastic frame. So I think it deserves to stay. Certainly. Um, with, next up, we've got the 533 Open Racer. Uh, and this is uh, an open source frame, right? Yeah, uh, designed by our friend Lamon. So the nice thing about this, it's a little bit heavier. Uh, Limon, uh, when I talked to him about the frame, told me that it was designed for, like their spot in Houston is a uh, parking lot and parking garage. That's what they race on the evenings. And obviously concrete and asphalt is gonna be a lot more brutal on your quad than like grass and trees. Um, so it's designed to be a little bit more durable uh, and a little bit more forgiving for beginners. Uh, in addition, it is an open source frame design. So like theoretically, you could cut it yourself if you had kind of weirdo with a carbon uh, CNC <laughs> in your garage. I know you're out there. Uh, and it's got lots of 3D printed parts. Uh, it fits most 30 and 20 millimeter stacks. It's just a great uh, beginner's choice. Uh, yeah. And uh, not too expensive. Well, 60, 60 bucks, that sounds inexpensive as I might've hoped for an open source frame. I really liked, um, I liked the uh season that um quads had pods i, I kind of miss pods i remember bit. that yeah like uh so this is this is obviously you know that type of setup where you can have a nice nylon or tpu pod and uh limone um just a brilliant person in general um has has done a lot of different variations of the pods that fit sure. with certain setups and certain yeah. like, there's a dj here. ipod and i mean the whole right. the whole shebang so you could really um, put any <clears> video <throat> transmitter you want in here Whereas if you're building something like the light switch, like there are certain video transmitters, like if you're like, well, I fly walk snail and I want to build a racing drone, light switch not going to work for you. Yeah, not not, not without some heavy modifications. Yeah, but so, um, to your point though about durability, like even just visually looking at Lamone's frame here, the open racer, uh, we've got four you know motor mount holes, right? You've got this big gnarly uh, motor protection uh, to you know save your save your motor bells from the asphalt. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the, that sucker's a tank. And uh, I know yeah. a lot of guys flying that one. 
Yeah. Um, so that's the open racer. We've got one other open source frame on here, and that's the TBS Source 2. And this, like one look at this, and you'll go, geez, what year was this designed? And it probably was like 2019. I don't know when it was actually designed, maybe not quite that far back. But what makes this stand out to me is it's freaking $25. It's open source. If you want an inexpensive frame and you don't want to buy some crappy, cheap Chinese clone, it's a solid frame. It'll get the job done and it's 25 freaking bucks or $16 if you order it direct from TBS. You just can't get in there cheaper than that. And I, I feel like that means it deserves to be on there. Yeah. Okay, so next we move to motors. And uh, the, the here's the thing. I don't know how much there's going to be for us to say about the motors. Like I look at a frame and I go, oh, here's the ins and outs of the frame. With the motors, we can put them on a bench and test them. And like guys like Chris Rosser are doing that. And you can look at the charts and go, okay, great. This motor makes a lot of thrust. It's efficient. At the end of the day, we pick these motors simply because top pilots are flying them. And that's like, that's it. Now, these motors do do well. If you look at Chris Rosser's thrust testing and so forth, all of these motors do pretty well. Um, but like, that's what it boils down to, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, to a degree, just looking at like, and these are all going to be great choices for higher KV. Um, but for instance, like the Champs Edition 5 through 3 motor or the MCK motor, um, I would trust them a lot more because they're high, they're high KV, 20, 2100 KV on 6S, mm -hmm. whereas I would not put the Emax Eco 2400 KV on 6S. Um, that's going to be a way to, to... No, 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 no. That, <laughs> that 2400... <laughs> I, again, I will say that... 4S, the, 5S, yeah. No one at Champs used the Emax Eco, and Limon said, don't put that on there. No one flies it. And I said, we need to have a budget option for people who are not trying to go to Champs and they just want to spend... And, and the Emax Eco has been my budget rock star for at least two years. It's just a solid, solid motor for... Well, it used to be like 12 or 14 bucks. Now it's like 16 bucks. And, uh, yeah. you know, that's how life has been. But I, I think that a beginner who's just getting in and wants to save money might pick the 1700 or the 1900 KV option. The 2400 KV would be for 4S, but most people aren't racing 4S. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, these kind of the premier, the rate, the motors that are racing motors um, that are in that high KV range, though, mm -hmm. do typically handle heat better. So in regard in regard to the windings and the uh, what is the insulator um, on the windings uh, the uh, enamel the enamel yeah so like um, that is an aspect that kind of goes into those um, that both the champs motor and I've heard that the MCK motor as well um, handles high heat uh, super well because uh, when you're racing at those KVs on these tracks uh, the yeah. motors are coming down um, insanely hot um, so. So there's a couple of things I want to say about selecting between these motors. Um, and that is that if you're like a normal person flying a multi-GP style track, I think I would suggest people go with a slightly lower KV, like the 1900, um, that the Champs Edition motor, which comes in at 2070 KV, just a little higher, and then the MCK motor, which comes in at 2100 KV, those are for people who need, like if you're never hitting full throttle, like don't if you look at your, right, you don't need that motor because you, you you don't need more power. But if you're regularly hitting full throttle, or I think if you're racing on a more open style track, like where there's a lot longer straights and sweeping turns, maybe you're getting up to that higher KV, that's where that's, uh, or higher speed, that's where those higher KV motors might come in. That's my thought. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the, the hard thing would be that if you're buying it new, um, mm -hmm. especially now in a, in a day and age where we've got such easy throttle caps or RPM limits right. that, you know, I don't see any hurt in buying the champs edition motor. I don't know if the, how the pricing compares, but, um, but back to the whole kind of like the switchback thing, you can probably find the 2207 or the 1960 original heads up motors really inexpensively out there because yeah. there were so many made. And, yeah. uh, and then, like I said, uh, right or wrong, people, you know, try to, you know, upgrade. And, and I just, I would have zero qualms. If you can find a great deal on yeah. heads up motors and like go for it. But if you're buying them new, I mean, I don't, I don't see a lot of hurt in just getting the champs motors. You can probably find those heads up, you know, the teal heads up motors in the wild, um, yeah. you know, relatively inexpensive or, um, you know, you have the ease of, of clicking on the affiliate links. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that, well, since you brought it up, I will say, uh, one of the ways that the website supports itself is through the use of affiliate links. Uh, almost all, not all, but almost all of the links that you see on the website are affiliate links. 
And that means if you click that link and then make a purchase at any affiliated vendor, then I get a little commission. Uh, and actually it's anything you buy. So like there's people out there who tell me, yeah, I just bookmark these, I just bookmark this 533 link. And before I go shop at 533, I click that link. And then I, you know, they're just paying me a little bit of money every time they go shopping. No, it's and, great. Uh, FPV pilots spend a lot of money. So, uh, like, I'm not like, I'm not like, you know, retiring anytime soon, but it does add up. Certainly. <laughs> um, okay. Let's move on to flight controllers and ESCs. Uh, and uh, I, I, for me, this category is where the racing really shines because racers just crush ESCs <laughs> and any ESC that you see it recommended here is like, no, nothing's bulletproof. Everything breaks eventually. But like, I feel like these are probably the most durable ESCs that you could buy for five inch drones today. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I don't have as much experience with the T motor gear, mm -hmm. um, but both Fox here and the hobby wing stacks, I know very well for seasons now. Um, they've yeah. been uh, just consistently. The big things that jump out on me, jump out to me on these that I personally consider. And like I said, I haven't run the T motor. I really like the Fox ear um, stacks. They were very consistent for me. But when I switched to HD zero, um, I started running the hobby wing stacks exclusively because it's a direct plug with the V3 VTX mm -hmm. from HD zero. Yeah. And uh, uh, I hate repinning and the so, less I can solder, the better. So, does the Fox ear have a plug, but it's not the right pin out or does it not have a HD plug at all? Correct. Yeah. Fox ear doesn't have an HD plug. And I, if I remember correctly, Fox ear only has five volts. Um, oh. a five volt rail maybe mm. uh but I th the to be clear mm. the hg0 vtx i'm pretty sure will run on on five volts okay. i'm gonna have to verify that but, but you have um, to solder it and you're like screw it i'll just switch right. flight controllers if it means i don't have to solder well you say you say that but like <clears> if, if you're going to a big race then you're not going with one drone like Correct. you're going how many drones do these guys bring to the races just round number oh i've always felt like if you're going to champs like five or six is a good number you know like uh yeah you know, in the field, but related to that though, like talking about, you know, soldering or not soldering the neat thing about if you're just using a plug with your VTX, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you'll have a drone that the ESC dies in, but the, mm -hmm. but the video system's still good. Well, right. now you can literally just unplug it. And now that you've right. got another one where the VTX burned up and you can do a, you know, a solderless swap is can be a big deal. So, yeah. um, I've always, uh, for the longest time I flew, uh, immersion RC and Orca stuff. Um, the, the immersion RC hybrid board was beautiful for that reason mm -hmm. that, uh, that typically it was like you had a stack issue or you had a control and video issue and mm -hmm. you kind of had two different components that could hot swap. Right. And, uh, I personally, as, as a racer, which I'm kind of more on the washed up old racer side now, I'm supporting my daughter, but, um, but, uh, uh, that was always very important to me to be able to, to be able to have like a modular, uh, type of situation. And it looks like the T motor would allow you to do that. You'd have to check the pin out, but I know for certain yeah. that the hobby wing stack, I love the fact that that is a direct plug with the yeah. latest, uh, HD zero VTX. Okay, great. Um, so just pick one of those basically. Yeah. I mean, they're all good. You can't just go pick wrong one and buy it and use it. Uh, yeah. and, and I would, I would even go so far as to say, if you're racing, like there, like if you decide, eh, I want to run a different motor. I want a different motor. Yeah, fine. You'd probably be fine. But like for these things, the ESC specifically takes so much abuse when racing that I would hesitate to deviate from from these unless I just knew for a fact. Number one, you're just getting a hell of a deal. Like if you're getting it super cheap, okay. Or or if you just want to you know be out in the wild and find the next big thing. Um, when we come to video transmitters, cameras, and video antennas, these we don't include on this page um, because it's going to differ depending on whether you're running DJI or analog. I am curious because um, you did the survey. Mm -hmm. How many? What percent of people are running digital versus analog at the nationals? Great question. Sixty-eight percent of people were running HD zero goggles at champs. So because because they're running either HD zero or analog, but HD zero goggles would lead you to believe that they're probably running uh, HD zero uh, goggles or if I you, don't, I mean, yeah, but I mean, like I run HD zero goggles as my main analog goggle. They're really good analog goggles. Let's find the VTX then. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would, I would argue that point a little bit. There you go. What VTX brand did you use? Uh, 63%. So it is a little different. 63% so said that they pre, ran. You're pretty, you're pretty much right though. It's pretty much the, yeah. all those guys, pretty much like you're being generous. Yeah. Um, so they're running uh, HD zero VTXs. 63% yeah. 
to 68% running yeah. H HD zero as their video system. Yeah. Uh, and then the rest is analog. Like nobody was running walk snail or DJI at, Ch at national. Like no. I don't even think yeah, you would allow that. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So that was a, that was a huge move. And I think, you know, um, I think that that has kind of hurt, you know, even control links for, um, immersion RC, because, when you, it was so nice having your video system and, and, and control mm -hmm. system kind of tied together. Well, yep. now when you switch to, uh, HD zero, then it kind of makes sense to maybe go with an open source yeah. uh, receiver, um, sure. to go in there. But, uh, yeah, ghost ghost makes the most sense if you're running analog yeah. because you can get a ghost receiver and analog VTX in a single board. That's the ghost hybrid. Oh, and so that's nice. so nice. Yeah. Like, but once you're not running analog, or not running Ghost, then it starts. You start being, oh well, I should go with HD Zero and Express LRS. Um, yep. I am curious that we're not. It doesn't re directly reflect on the uh, the the shopping list page, but I am curious if you could tell us the breakdown for Control Links. Yeah, let's check it out. Um, what Control Link did you use? Uh, and to, so we do pretty good. Like I said, I've been really surprised with how many responses we get. I think there were 111 people at Champs. And we got 89 responses. So it's yeah, pretty, that's it's, a high, high response. Yeah, rate. pretty thorough. So 68% um, were on Express LRS. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ghost was 19%. Um, wow. Tr Tracer was 10%. And then we've got some slivers for uh, at one FR Sky holdout. Oh, my God. And, and, Look, uh, bro. and one. Whoever Spectrum. you are, <laughs> let, I will buy you an Express LRS module. <laughs> What? please do why are you going to like it's not even like this is just, you went to nationals with free sky right oh we my always God. have to consider maybe the uh someone's trolling that could always happen that's possible that's possible <laughs> if he had said fly sky i would know he was trolling right free sky it could be legit now yeah. uh, surprisingly crossfire is basically dead for racing is what i mean yeah hearing. nobody was on crossfire this year no chance. literally wow yeah there you go um which I think, if I had to guess, comes down to because there was a season that it was that it was very popular, um, and Absolutely. I think at this stage, uh, the the antennas are obviously very large for 900 megahertz Absolutely. and uh, and heavy and um, but because uh, if you're going to have a, a big antenna, you got to make sure it's durable because it's just going to get whacked, you know, yep. every chance yep. it gets. But um, but two or three years ago, it was the fastest uh, control right. link available, the lowest right? latency. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, we would deal with the gigantic antennas and, um, right. uh, that kind of thing. But, uh, but now obviously, uh, you can buy a ELRS with a thousand, you know, uh, Hertz, whatever, uh, update update with a chip antenna, <laughs> you know, right. so it's yeah. just, so. um, hard to, hard to compete. Like, is there something you want to plug? i feel like you multi GP website. What do you want to plug Sean? Yeah, that's, that's, what's important to me now. Um, well, it's been important to me for a long time, but, uh, but multi GP, you know, I, I know you have a lot of viewers here that you, um, have watched your, your channel, uh, that, you know, are out here flying drones, doing freestyle, mm -hmm. check out drone racing. You might be, you might be surprised uh, how fun it is for me. Um, freestyle as enjoyable and as freeing as it was, um, it was very subjective. And so I think the first yeah. time I went to a race. And I knew exactly where I stood as a pilot. Um, yeah. You know, it, having that objective sense of, of what was going on was very compelling for me. Um, freestyle and racing obviously is not, uh, you know, a this or this. It's it's an and oh, thing. Yeah. And uh, I would just encourage pilots, if you haven't, you know, head to multigp.com, find uh, a chapter in your area. If you don't have a chapter in your area, um, there's a there's a link on there. You can start a chapter. We've got a great chapter support team um, where we feel like there's a lot of momentum currently uh, with drone racing um, over the, over this past year. And uh, we would love to get drone racing going in your community if you don't have uh, people out there doing it. And uh, even if you're flying DJI, like, let's get out there. Let's, Absolutely. let's, let's have some fun on the weekend and, uh, and go fast and hit gates. Yeah, um, so uh, I've got your website up. Uh, I know you can't see my screen, but uh, if you guys go to multigp.com, and then what I like to do is go to chapters and find chapters. Uh, and you can certainly search, but my favorite is to go to the chapter map. If you go to the map view, Same. and then you're like, okay, well, let's say I, I you know, live in Florida around the Orlando area. Boom, I just zoom in. And I can see there's three chapters in the Orlando area. I can click on them. I can reach out to the chapter organizer or the contact person. Sometimes the chapter's kind of gone dead. Like there's, they're not as active, but like that's where I would start. 
And I would just go out, like find out when they're doing a race and just go. You know what? If you're a little, maybe a little intimidated, just go and hang out, hang out, eat pizza, drink a soda, whatever, get to know the people, get comfortable. But if you are thinking about racing, I want to say that don't be intimidated because most of the time the races, race organizers are just the nicest freaking people. And if you're slow and if you don't know what the, the they'll, they'll just be friends and get you going and it'll be a great experience. Um, yeah, it's one of the easiest ways to find a uh, drone, you know, FPV drone community, right? For uh, even if you're not interested in racing, certainly. I hate racing. I never want to race, but I'm so lonely right now. And I just want people <laughs> to freestyle with on the weekend. I just want to say ESC without people looking weird at me. You all, know, like. <laughs> all of the people at the race will also freestyle with you on the weekends. It's certainly. just a way to connect with your community. Or maybe after the race, you know, you can go yeah. to a spot. Like, absolutely. Did you, did you see that grain tower on the way absolutely. here? Yeah, let's, absolutely. Let's go and run like the you hobby. Said, <laughs> if there's not a chapter in your area, yeah. then start a chapter and you don't really have to like, you're like, well, I don't, I'm not quali qualified to start a chapter. You will be the seed from which the chapter will grow because other Certainly. people will be like, I want to, and they'll find you on the map and then you'll hook up with you, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, I really encourage people to do that because racing makes you a better pilot. It absolutely does. Without so a doubt. It absolutely does. And it's fun on its own. Yeah. Enough, enough said. Um, I think if people are interested in FPV racing, I'm going to put a card on screen and a link in the video description. I did a video a little while back about what's a multi-GP race like. I just sort of vlogged a day at a multi-GP race, uh, and I'm going to put a link to that. And if people want to check it out, they can. Sean, do you want to you want to throw out a video we'll put on screen and a link in the description? You got an idea? Uh, how about I shout out? I want to shout out the uh, the fastest female drone pilot in drone racing right now. Uh, this is not objective, <laughs> but my okay. daughter Callie, she's kicking it on on social media and stuff. Check her out on YouTube, Callie FPV K A L L I. Okay. Uh, just going to shout her out. Check out her YouTube channel. So all right, we'll put a card on screen and a link in the video <laughs> description to that as well. Oh, you know what else we ought we ought to not forget is Limon uh, yes. Ivan Efimov, and I'm going to link to his channel. He is an incredibly creative and entertaining, knowledgeable. He's a racing pilot. He's a beta flight developer. Uh, and if you're not following his content, you totally should. And I'll pick a video of his. Maybe the video where you guys went deep into the survey. I'll put a link cool. to that. Oh, all the cards on screen and links down below. I'll see you at one of those videos. Thank yeah. you so much, Sean. You bet.